The properties of clay minerals have the following general characteristics. They have small particle sizes. They're plastic across a range of water contents. By plastic, what I mean is that they can be molded by hand, like a sculpting clay or something like that. Uh, and they tend to have really high dry strength. So if they get dried up, they tend to be like little bricks. You've probably experienced this before uh, by looking at a little chunk of, of really hard clay that's been dried up. They have a high potential for shrink and swell. So the water content uh, can change significantly and the volume can change significantly. They have a high resistance to weathering. Okay, what that means is that the particles themselves don't really break down further. Now they came from a parent rock where they were all together in some orientation and have broken down to become these clay minerals, but they're highly resistant to further weathering from that point on. And importantly, the particles have a net negative charge due to uh, electrochemical surface interactions. Clay minerals are built from two important building blocks. One of them is a, a silica tetrahedron. It's shown here in the uh, upper left corner and it consists of a silicon uh, atom in the middle with oxygens on the four sides in a tetrahedral shape. Now single tetrahedra don't tend to just exist on their own. They form tetrahedral sheets as shown here in this diagram. It's a little bit difficult to visualize because it's a two-dimensional representation of something that's three-dimensional but you can imagine there are silica, uh, silicon atoms at the center of each of these tetrahedra. Um, this is an up above view that shows what they look like. They organize into these hexagonal shapes where each triangle is a separate silicon tetrahedron. And then they're often represented by this diagram that shows their characteristic sort of triangular edge shape and they, they form these, these sheets um, at the time of mineral formation. The other important building block is the octahedral sheet. And this one's formed by an aluminum or magnesium or other cation with um, hydroxyls or oxygens at the uh, edge points. And they form um, these sorts of sheets like shown here in item B. And they're represented by this sort of rectangular uh, diagram shape right there. And this is an up above view showing how they're all um, linked together. Okay, if we take these two building blocks, the tetrahedral sheet and the octahedral sheet, they will bond together to form different clay minerals. And the clay minerals that form really depends on what elements are available at the time that these sheets were formed. So this is a schematic that shows how kaolinite is formed. It consists of a single silicon tetrahedral sheet bonded to an octahedral sheet. And it just so happens that the distance between these sheets comes out to be 0 0.72 nanometers. So here's the atomic structure of kaolinite showing that uh, tetrahedral sheet on the top bonded to the octah octahedral sheet there on the bottom. And this is a scanning electron micrograph of some kaolinite. Um, this one's pretty well crystallized. The length of the bar is, is 5 microns here. So you can see the platy nature of these clay minerals. Um, this one is a scanning electron micrograph of halocyte from Colorado. Halocyte is formed from the same ingredients as kaolinite, but it's formed in a way that the particles bend as they're being formed and, and they develop these little straw-like features with uh, adsorbed water on the inside and they look like little straws but are formed from the same thing as kaolinite. This is a schematic diagram of the structure of montmorillonite. So montmorillonite has two silicone tetrahedral sheets with an octahedral sheet in the middle and the distance between those is 0 0.96 nanometers. Now uh, the kaolinite sheets tend to bond together fairly strongly so that you don't really get uh, potential for them to move apart. These ones, you know, this structure here can actually move quite a distance from this structure if water gets in there. So uh, montmorillonite tends to have a really high swell potential and these particles can get pretty far apart and then if it dries out they come back together 
as this distance decreases. Uh, if cations get in there, it can form strong bonds that affect the shrink swell potential of montmorillonite. So surface interactions are really important for these montmorillonite clays. These tend to form much thinner and uh, longer sheets. So the aspect ratio, the width or length to the thickness of montmorillonite tends to be much, much bigger than kaolinite. This shows the atomic structure of montmorillonite. Again, it has the two silica tetrahedral sheets with the octahedral sheet in the middle. And this is a scanning electron micrograph. Um, the, these slides, by the way, are from the Holtz and Kovacs textbook, as indicated in the footer there on the bottom. Um, so this is sodium montmorillonite from Wyoming. And again, the length of the bar is 5 microns. You can see that these really look thin and, and sort of fragile. Uh, this is a diagram showing illite. So I mentioned that these sheets can move apart from each other. Well, if you get potassium ions in between them, that will bond them together and it forms illite. So the only difference between montmorillonite and illite is the presence of this potassium in between the sheets. And uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of illite. It tends to be um, somewhat similar in the terms of the platiness to montmorillonite, except the aspect ratio tends to be a little bit smaller. They don't have the, the really big width or height to uh, thickness ratio like montmorillonite does, so less swell potential. Here's a, a schematic diagram of chlorite, which technically is a clay mineral, but it doesn't really behave like a clay so much. So instead of getting potassium, you get another uh, sheet in there called brucite or gibbsite, and that will bond these clay minerals together in this sort of very blocky, bulky structure. Uh, here's a scanning electron micrograph of atapulgite from Florida. Um, the space is 0.5 microns. These minerals are sort of curled up again. Um, so let's look at some of the overall engineering properties of pure clay minerals. The specific surface area for kaolinite tends to be 10 to 20 meters squared per gram. Halocyte's a little bit higher. Remember halocyte was those straw-shaped minerals 35 to 70 meters squared per gram. Uh, smectite, which contains montmorillonite as part of its family, can have specific surface area as high as 800 meters squared per gram. So that was the soil I talked about. If you had one gram of smectite, you can cover a football field with it. And then illite is intermediate between smectite and kaolinite, 65 to 100 meters squared per gram. And chloride is kind of a bulky mineral, so its specific surface isn't even quantified here. In terms of the Atterberg limits, the liquid limit of pure kaolinite tends to be 30 to 75, same for halocyte. Smectite can be 100 to 900, so you can have a water content of 900% before a smectite, pure smectite mineral will transition from a solid to a liquid behavior. And then illite can be 60 to 120. Keep in mind, these are pro properties of the pure minerals. These minerals don't tend to exist in nature in a pure form. They're blended in with silt and other types of clay. So this is if you isolate just the smectite minerals and measure their liquid limit. Uh, the plastic limit for kaolinite, 25 to 40. Halocyte, 30 to 60. Smectite is 50 to 100. And illite is 30 to 60. Um, the shrink swell potential is negligible for kaolinite. Halocyte may shrink. It turns out that if you dry them out, they can the individual little straws can split apart and lose some of that absorbed water, which will cause them to shrink. Smectite has very high shrink swell potential, and illite has low shrink swell potential because of the presence of those cast those potassium cations in the space between the minerals. The hydraulic conductivities are given here in centimeters per second over quite a range. Okay, this is a two order of magnitude range: ten to the minus five to ten to the minus seven. Same for halocyte. Smectite, 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9. This is very low hydraulic conductivity. And then illite is 10 to the minus 6 to up to 10 to the minus 8. Again, intermediate between smectite and the kaolinite minerals. Okay, the C sub C value, this is the coefficient of um, virgin compression, tends to be around 0.2 to 0.3 for kaolinite, as high as 1 to 2.6 for smectite. So smectite minerals tend to be much more compressible and that has to do with just the way that the minerals orient themselves relative to each other. 
Although the surface carries a negative charge, the ends of these clay minerals actually have a positive charge. So they often tend to orient themselves in a, an end to face configuration that has a very large uh, void space and can be highly susceptible to compression. The uh, friction angle for these minerals for kaolinite generally 24 to 30. For smectite can be as low as 5 degrees. So uh, what happens is that these minerals get oriented such that all of their uh, long um, sides are in contact with each other and they slide past each other in that configuration very easily. This is actually the cause of a lot of landslides that form in sedimentary rock formations that have significant amounts of smectite minerals in them. So you can get failures of, of rock on very gentle slopes if they have these smectite minerals. And then illite is intermediate again, 17 to 24 degrees.